Good morning, Richard. How are you? I'm Scott. Uh, can you hear me? Fantastic. All right. Well, good morning. Um, I think I may wait maybe one minute for us to get started, but uh, we'll be getting going in one moment. Okay. So I'm in New York. Uh, can I ask where you're, uh, where you guys are broadcasting from? So this is international. This is really exciting. You know, by the way, uh, throughout the masterclass, um, I've enabled you to uh, be able to turn on your microphones if you decide to. Anytime you want to ask a question, participate in any way, uh, you're more than welcome to use the chat. But of course, if you'd like to, um, then please, by all means, um, use the microphone. I'm very happy to, uh, you know, and hopefully we can have some conversations about things. Okay. Ottawa, fantastic. I've been to Ottawa once a long time ago and I have fond memories. I don't get to travel to Canada enough. <laughs> I've been to Toronto a couple of times for some seminars in Ottawa for a gig and man, I always love it there. Um, and uh, Richard, uh, where are you? That's okay. All right. So we'll get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. So those of you who, I'm sorry. Good morning. I'm from Rich. I'm Rich Coble from uh, Columbus, Ohio. Oh, Columbus, Ohio. Well, hello, Richard. Great for you to, to be here. Thanks for coming. And Glenn, welcome, uh, Charles. Uh, so we'll get ourselves started. Um, so I have enabled everyone's um, microphones. Of course, anytime you'd like to uh, ask a question or you have a comment, um, I really hope that this is as interactive as possible. I have a plan uh, uh, just to, to share some of my thoughts on, on uh, some aspects of saxophone tone development. But of course, um, any selections that any of you may have wanted to play for me during the master class, if that's what you choose to do, then I'm very happy to hear you. Um, could you please let me know if you planned on participating um, uh, by performing a, a selection for me to uh, uh, comment on? Oh, Glenn, Glenn in Australia. Well, thank you so much for, for uh, taking the time to be here, especially with the time difference. I really appreciate that. And that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so, so if anyone has any selections that they uh, wanted to play, uh, if you don't mind uh, listing that in chat so that I know and then we can make sure to have um, enough time set aside to uh, hear everybody. I really want to give you that time. Um, what I would like to start off with though um, is uh, a word on uh, saxophone tone development. So I've been playing saxophone for quite a long time, uh, about 27 years. Um, I am 35 years old. I'm from New York. I still live in New York. Um, I'm a performer in both jazz and classical styles. Um, I also teach at um, um, a college uh, that's part of the uh, City University of New York system. And uh, for me, I found that the most elusive skill, and also for me, also the, the most important skill for saxophone is tone. Uh, I truly feel that with enough work, any saxophonist can have great fingers. And when we get to a particular level, it's pretty much expected that our fingers move pretty fast. Um, and of course there's variations and degrees of, of ability, but um, it's, the technique is, at least in the practice room, it comes down to a bit of a mindless repetition, which is not a bad thing. It can be meditative certainly, um, but it's all there. It's all laid out for us. We see where our fingers go. There's not too much of, a, of, a, of an issue there, but, what is elusive is how we shape our tone and how we can use our tone to our advantage, particularly for those of us who are interested in performing in more than one style, because there are certainly differences 
in the expected or desired tone quality for let's say a classical song as opposed to maybe a contemporary jazz recording. So what I'd like to share with you are my thoughts on what you can do as just a daily activity to help get in touch with the physical mechanisms that allow you to manipulate that. And then you can use it to whatever end you like. These are exercises and, and uh, little bits of wisdom that I've picked up from lots of experiences. Um, some of them are a bit of my own construction, but many of them are really based on the experiences I've found from working with both jazz, classical, and pop musicians. So uh, the most important thing here, and, and for me, what I teach any of my students, is that you need to understand what one physically has to do in order to produce a desired effect. So listening to recordings is essential, of course. Um, hearing what you'd like to sound like and have that idea in your mind's ear, so to speak. But there's no substitute for understanding exactly what you physically need to do in order to produce that desired effect. And sometimes that can be difficult when we're talking about anything that's going on in the mouth, because we obviously can't see it. And when we describe it, we have to describe it in a way that someone else not only hears our result, but understands what, they, what that person physically did to produce the result. And that can be very difficult. It's also a conversation that many saxophonists never have. We may talk about things like how much to bite or how little to bite, how much mouthpiece to take in, and those things are very helpful, but there are some other things that we can do. So um, what I'd like to do is, uh, if you would indulge me for a moment, uh, I would like to play a short excerpt for you um, this is a classical excerpt from a, uh, an etude book that was originally intended for oboists, and many of you may be familiar with the Fairling etude book. Um, some consider it a fairly simple etude book. However, for me, it's been um, an absolute joy over the years to come back to these again and again. And I know that clarinetists know them, saxophonists know them, oboists, even some flutists have been playing transcriptions of these. They're just beautiful melodies. They teach you how to express. Um, but for my purposes, it's a great way of working on tone quality. So I'd like to start out, um, and if you don't mind, uh, this is just a, a short excerpt uh, from one of the Fairling A2s. Also a way for us to check to see if, um, able to hear my uh, saxophone playing on my mic. Okay. <laughs> An excerpt from this uh, very beautiful uh, Fairling Etude. They're all absolutely beautiful pieces. You know, one thing that I love about them is throughout each of them, it forces you to move back and forth between different registers. And that's a central concept for what I do uh, to procure um, and maintain a good tone. Uh, perhaps the most important element of that is uh, overtone studies. And 
I'm sure that if you're a saxophonist or any wind player, um, that you've encountered overtone studies, but I'm not sure if maybe you've encountered it in the way that I choose to do it. So I'd like to give you just a little bit of an inkling into, into what, I, uh, what I tend to do here. Um, so for example, um, it's probably well known to most of you that um, if you take the lower notes of the saxophone, you can use your throat and or your tongue in order to get a higher tone. Um, I like to work with overtones every morning, um, maybe just about 10 to 15 minutes. I really don't do that much every day, but it's the consistency of working with it each day because what you're trying to do is build muscle memory. And it's through muscle memory that you can figure out how to physically produce the mechanisms that shape your tone quality. Um, so uh, the concept of voicing on the saxophone, um, I think can be best achieved by doing these simple exercises uh, day after day in just a few minutes, really 10 to 15 minutes a day is all you need. Um, if you really want to go longer and do a, a nice hour of overtones, if it makes you happy, then by all means go to town, but I only do it 15 minutes. Um, so for example, if I were to take a low B flat, now you may be familiar with, let's say Sigurd Rascher's top tones or some older methods that tell you to start with the fundamental tone and keep going up on the overtones like this. And go up and up and up the overtones. And I think that's useful, especially if you haven't worked with overtones before. Um, if this is a new concept to you, I, I really recommend that you check out um, a book called Top Tones by Sigurd Rascher, and I'm putting this in the chat. Uh, many of you may already be familiar with it. And, and I think that's very useful because if you haven't encountered the overtones, you want to first understand what the overtone series is um, and basic ideas about the order of the overtones that you should expect above a fundamental. It's essentially treating the saxophone like a trumpet or like a bugle, that without changing the fingering, you can use the mechanisms in your mouth and throat to change the sound. And this is really where we get to the crux of the matter is you may have worked with overtones and done this, but maybe not have targeted exactly what part of your mouth and throat is working in order to produce that result. And if you can understand what that is and consistently target it with just short exercises, then over time, relatively short period of time, you'll develop the muscle memory that allows you to manipulate your tone when you're not playing overtones. Because sometimes overtones may seem like an exercise that is very far removed from your everyday playing. And in some cases it might be, you may be playing a top tones exercise or something similar, and then you put that aside and then, well, your mouth and throat goes back to whatever position you normally use when you blow into the instrument. But we can learn something else from it. So I like to do two specific things with overtones and um, they're difficult in the fact that you want to be able to maintain a good tone when you do it, but you'd have to be patient with yourself. Sometimes you're going to get squeaks and squawks and don't be discouraged because that's part of the learning process. Um, so for example, what I would do is if I start with that fundamental B flat, that low tone, the first overtone above it is just an octave higher. So for example, right that first overtone sounds like middle b flat um, but of course i'm playing it with all the fingers down what i do is i start with just a long tone a very sustained tone um, on that note and i don't do anything else with it. it's very simple And the idea is to, over time, develop a sense that the front of the mouth is really not doing any of the work. Now, I know that there are lots of different methods of learning the saxophone, lots of different methods of um, forming your embouchure. And of course, I wouldn't go against what any of you are doing if you're comfortable with it and you like the tone you're producing. But my method is that the front of my mouth is quite loose as I play. I only have enough pressure on my jaw um, so that I feel like I can uh, seal 
the air from coming out of my mouth as I play. And that's all that I'm trying to do. Everything else that I do when I play is all voicing from the throat. So even when I play an overtone like that, the reason why I'll play a long tone as part of that, that warm up is not just to play the overtone, but to make sure that I'm not using the front of the mouth. I like to describe this as a, um, a scale. If you have two sides of the scale, the front of the scale is the lips and the jaw. The back of the scale is your throat and your tongue. And those are the only two options that you have to affect your tone quality. You can't do anything else, right? So if for some reason, if a player likes to use a lot of the front of the mouth and likes to bite, um, then that means that they'll be using less of the throat. I use a lot of throat movement um, and therefore, I don't need to use anything in the front. And I think that it allows the reed to vibrate better. I think it allows me to have a better sustained tone. And also, I don't fatigue as much. Um, I can go a very long time without having to uh, take a break. Um, so the second thing that I do with this, and it, of course, it may be something that you've done before, is I drop the overtones downward, which is something that's different than most of these method books. Most of them go upward all the time. And I think the problem with that is after a while, it can become a little bit like a parlor trick, um, showing people how high you can play overtones. And that's not necessarily the purpose of it. The purpose of it should be to explore what your throat is doing when you're using the correct position. Um, so for example, if I start on that second overtone, I will play the note and try to let the note, not force it, but let it drop down to the original low B flat like this. Now, for me to achieve that, I didn't open my jaw. I didn't loosen my mouth. What I did was I relaxed the throat just a little bit. And by doing that, I'm giving myself vital information. One is how tight did my throat even need to be to play the overtone itself, which is most likely not nearly as tight as you may think. And then to drop down to the original note, I'm also working on my ability to play the low tones. Um, I'm very happy having a nice robust low register, but it doesn't sound booming. And the reason is I've found which throat position is the optimal position for me. Now, how does this kind of skill translate to a practical situation when we're not playing overtones? Well, um, in the excerpt that I performed um, a few minutes ago, there was a section that kept going to low D and moving up the octave. Um, and this is often a very difficult thing for saxophonists to do. Like for example, um, um, here. Here we go. That back and forth of going from a high pitch to a very low pitch is often a very elusive skill for saxophonists of any style that we often get this, this delay of the note dropping back down. And the only reason why it does that is because unbeknownst to us, we are actually telling the saxophone, don't play the low octave because we've tightened up so much that we forget that we have to relax the throat. And so that's the primary reason why I practice the overtones going downward. It's a simple skill and it may seem like it's looking at just one small skill out of everything that you would possibly consider as a saxophonist, but I think that there's no substitute for being able to play in the low register and the high register uh, with the same amount of ease. Um, the higher that you play with your overtones, you do the same thing. If you're playing on, let's say, a, a higher overtone, then you can still practice cascading your overtones very slowly back down each level until you get to the original. And of course, it's a lot harder to do that uh, than uh, just going up the overtones, right? The opposite direction is very hard to do. So for example, like this. from a high overtone and cascading downward, that's much harder to do. Um, and the saxophone is uniquely uh, uh, positioned to be able to do this because our instrument includes every overtone. Clarinetists can do this as well, 
but you have less overtones available to you because the clarinet, um, and this is an amazing thing that the construction of the instrument does this, is that it skips every other overtone in the series. Um, so that's the reason why the clarinet has a register key instead of an octave key. Um, but being that we have that available on saxophone, it's a, it's a great uh, tool to figure out exactly where you want your throat position to be for any given register. And it's, it's like I said, it's an easy exercise, but it's one that I do uh, every day, maybe for only like 10 to 15 minutes tops, uh, sometimes even less. Um, and I always start with that no matter what I'm playing. Uh, I do this on, uh, well, this happens to be a classical mouthpiece I'm using, but I use it for my jazz mouthpieces as well. And it's also a great exercise to use if you're trying to get used to a new mouthpiece. Always find how the overtones feel on a mouthpiece and then you'll be able to figure out where you want your throat position to be, how much mouth pressure you want to use, et cetera. It, I think all things in tone quality come from this, from doing this and from developing the muscle memory from listening to yourself and being patient. Okay. Um, so uh, is there anyone here um, who had a selection that they would like to play for me? If not, then uh, that's totally fine, but I, I didn't, I wasn't given information prior. Um, I don't know if we had collected any info about that, but um, is there anyone that would like to uh, play something for me? It could be in either a jazz or a classical repertoire, that's fine. And if not, that's okay. I can just you know continue on with this. Okay, all right, so I'll assume not, and that's fine. Um, so what I'll do is I'll continue with this idea. Um, of course, even in an hour master class, it's not uh, enough. Oh, okay. So, um, Christopher, thank you. Um, give me one moment. I'm just reading your. Um... So, Christopher is saying, uh, I play clarinet in a local orchestra. The conductor asked me to play bass clarinet and short sax solo for the Rachmaninoff symphonic dances. That's a beautiful piece. He was fine with my bass clarinet playing, but said clearly did not play classical sax. True that I only have played sax in jazz groups. However, how do I work on getting the classical sax sound apparently that I couldn't get? That's a fantastic question. Thank you so much uh, uh, for being here. And, um, you know, uh, this exercise that I just described is really the start of that. Um, tenor saxophone, I believe if I, if we're talking about symphonic dances, we're talking about the, the tenor saxophone part, is that correct? Oh, yes, of course. I understand, Glenn. I appreciate that, but thank you. And thank you for being here at 2.20 a.m. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate that. Um, so, Christopher, are we talking about uh, the uh, tenor saxophone solo, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correct? Or is this alto? It is alto. Okay. So the reason I ask, uh, although it's not a big deal necessarily. All the four main voices of saxophone, of course there are more, but from soprano down to baritone can all use this exact same exercise. And in fact, when I practice saxophone, I'm mostly an alto and a soprano player, but I do play quite a lot of tenor. Um, but for me, I consider tenor to be a double for me. And you may consider saxophone your, your, your double, uh, so to speak. Um, all the saxophone voices can use this. How the overtones behave depending on the voice of saxophone changes a bit. As the instrument gets lower in range, because there are more overtones available from these lower tones, it may at first be difficult to find the position that isolates exactly what overtone you want to work with. So for example, alto saxophonists might find that isolating the first overtone, the octave above that low B flat, to be a little bit easier than, than for tenor saxophone players at first. Oftentimes, tenor players, by accident, flip up to the third or fourth overtone on their first try, which reveals a lot about how they're playing. It means that they're playing with a position that's way too tight. And you may find that the optimal position in terms of your throat and your voicing to be in a different position for bass clarinet that works well for bass clarinet, but maybe just doesn't work for alto. Um, I'd say that the, the mouth position is basically the same, except that the angle of the mouthpiece is so much different that it does change a couple of variables. Because the saxophone isn't as steep, you're not at that 45 degree angle, then that means that um, 
in order for you to find the optimal amount of pressure, you may feel like you have to close your mouth a little bit more than you were comfortable with. And you should experiment with it. Because of course, you don't want to close your mouth enough that it cuts off the sound. Um, as with clarinet, the main objective is let the reed vibrate as much as possible. I even feel like volume is just a byproduct of what your actual objective should be, which is make that reed move, right? So you, for example, if you're thinking about how much lip to put over your bottom teeth um, or anything like that, understand that the more lip you put over your teeth, the more it's going to muffle the reed. So you may have to make adjustments from what you do on bass clarinet, but it's not a completely different mouth position. What is going to feel very different, however, is the voicing. And that's where overtones come in. And I feel like it's going to go a long way uh, to help you. These long tones on any overtone, like I did um, a few minutes ago, I think maybe a few people uh, had entered uh, while we were doing this. Um, I had demonstrated that if I start on low B flat as an example, and play the first overtone above that, just as a long tone, As I do that, I am constantly reassessing what I'm doing. I feel like it's, it, there's so much thought that goes into doing this that it's probably more mentally tiring than it is physically tiring to do this kind of exercise. As I'm doing this, I'm considering how much pressure is in the front? How much am I biting? Am I pursing my lips as I play? Because you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that the throat is doing most of the work in order to find that optimal position. And then as another objective, can you start exactly on the overtone level that you intended? If you, let's say, finger that low B flat, can you target and play that first overtone above, or does it come out as another overtone other than the one that you wanted? If it comes out as a higher overtone, then that means simply that your throat position was tighter than it needed to be. So if you make squeaks and squawks, for example, when you're trying this, don't uh, assume that it's just a mistake and consign it to the, the waste bin of, of mistakes. You can learn from it. You're going to learn much more from making a mistake than from playing it right the first time. And any time that I make a mistake like that, whether I'm playing overtones or not, I stop and I think, okay, I did something to make the horn do that, right? We are constantly giving the instrument directions. And many of the directions we're giving the instrument we're not aware of. So if we become aware of what we physically do that causes that to happen, um, we can control it. And that's why I feel overtones are really at the heart of this. Um, and hopefully I'm, I'm explaining this in a way that's giving more detail than you know just simply say practice your overtones. This is how I practice them at any level. The higher you go with an overtone, um, you do the same thing. Practice it as a long tone. Then also practice to if you can cascade down to each overtone level until you get to the original fundamental note. It's difficult to drop that, that overtone level to level. That takes time to do. Um, but keep in mind when you do it, try not to drop the jaw. The moment you start to drop the jaw, you'll get what I call clown shoes. Right? When you get that kind of sound, when you're trying to drop it, you don't want to hear a dip in the intonation. Okay. Now, something else that can help get that classical sound is, uh, and now this is something that also will help clarinetists, many of us don't consider what to do with the tongue when we're not tonguing. And it should be something that all teachers are talking about and all professionals talk about, and some do, but many don't really consider it. They're all about the tongue when it's making contact with the reed, but when it's not, they don't seem to care about it. But it's in your mouth the whole time, of course. It's a big part of the mouth cavity. So what you do with the tongue when you're just blowing into the instrument and sounding a note is just as important. And for that, I rely on using syllables as easy mnemonic devices to get my tongue in the position that I want. So for example, on alto saxophone or soprano saxophone, because they're higher saxophone voices, you may need the back of your tongue to be in a slightly higher position in a relative sense. So for example, if I said the syllable ah, when you say ah, it makes the back of the tongue go down to the lower palate. Um, and you don't want your, your tongue in that position, 
because it's going to give you a more hollow sound. But if you want that warmer, darker tone, you need the tongue to be in a higher position. It makes the air move faster in your throat, creates the air pressure that gives you a darker sound. So I'll demonstrate this. The, the preferred uh, syllable that I use to be completely truthful is probably not, it's not a true syllable, at least it's not a syllable found in the English language. It's more of maybe something in between a lowercase e as in letter or bet, something between that and maybe the sound of like a schwa, like uh. It's somewhere in between that because this, is, this just comes from years of my experimenting and finding which syllable is the best for me. So a, gr a great way for you to practice it is simply put the mouthpiece in playing position and actually vocalize a syllable. Let your tongue go in that position and see what sound quality you get. Experiment with this. Practicing should be just, it's, it's a scientific method and you, you should let it be that. Um, I feel like we get too caught up in the idea of expressing so much that we forget that in the practice room, it's a laboratory. And if we treat it like that, then we can get very quick results. So for example, if I say, um, ah, right? So I'll put the, I'll say, ah, ah. Now I'm obviously not saying it with the front. I'm not opening my mouth. I'm trying to do this more like a ventriloquist would, right? So that just the back of my uh, mouth is sounding out the sound ah, and then I'll play with that position. And you don't even need a tongue, just blow into the instrument. Ah. That's the kind of sound quality I get when I use ah. I feel like it becomes very hollow. Um, there's not as much air pressure. I can't control it as much. But if I use a syllable where my tongue goes a little bit higher, let's say eh, as in letter or bet. So I'll say eh, and then I'll play, and I'll get a different sound quality. Eh, eh, eh. <laughs> And you can hear that, I mean, hopefully, you know, even over Zoom, I hope that it translates enough that you can hear a sound quality change. Um, but the quality is a bit darker, a bit more focused, a bit warmer. And you may find that once you bring your tongue up past a certain level, you get diminishing returns or that it feels uncomfortable. Okay. It should never hurt. You should never have any pain doing this. I've had students that tried to keep the tongue so high that they were saying that the sides of their throat by their gland area uh, was becoming very fatigued. If that happens, then you're doing it way too much. You shouldn't need to do it any more than what your mouth would and tongue would do if you're voicing out that syllable. Okay. But this is the essence of what we literally call voicing. Okay, now voicing also includes the larynx muscles when we start to go to the higher registers, like for the altissimo range or when we're working on overtones. But if you're working with the normal range of the instrument, you won't have to use nearly that much th throat change. And most of it will simply be a tongue position. And again, just like muscle memory is the name of the game with overtones, muscle memory is also uh, the primary focus when you one, find the position that's good for you, the position that you, that you like to use, and two, making that habit so that you no longer have to think about it, okay? So you should experiment with it. You may find five fantastic saxophone players who, you've, who use five completely different tongue positions, and you have to use what's right for you. We all have different sized mouth cavities, throat cavities, et cetera. Um, generally, though, for all four voices of saxophone, you're going to find that the tongue position for uh, classical saxophone is going to be on the higher side. It's going to be toward the soft palate in the back of the mouth. And we're talking about the back of the tongue. I'm not talking about pointing the, the, the front of the tongue upward. We're talking about that the, the tongue is in this kind of shape. It's naturally a curved shape, right? And so we're taking the back of the tongue and bringing it so ah, eh, e, eh, ah, right? That's the difference that we're talking about. So the front of the tongue is always in the same relative position. You want it available so that it can touch the reed. Uh, it's not supposed to actually make contact with the bottom palate. If we do that, that's what some people call anchor tonguing. Um, and that often happens with very young students. If you ever hear this kind of tonguing, 
that kind of um, fuzzy tonguing comes from a student trying to use a point very far back on their tongue to make contact with the reed, and it's just not precise enough. Okay, so we're talking about movement of the back of the tongue to find a position of how much that that humped uh, uh, a position of the saxophone should be pointing toward the toward the soft palate. I think you'll find that you'll get uh, Christopher. I think you'll find that you'll get great results with that, and just experiment with it. Okay, it may be something that you didn't. Um... Oh, great! I'm happy you could. Yeah, I know sometimes with these, uh, you know, even even with uh, having a, a better quality microphone here, I, I'm not always sure whether people can hear it, but uh, it's a, it sounds like a simple fix. Um, what is less simple about it is creating a sense of muscle memory, right? And that's just about doing it consistently, but you should be willing to experiment, experiment with the overtones, experiment with, um, with the syllables. Um, one other piece of advice, and this specifically relates to moving between octaves, um, if I use a, an excerpt from, let's say, the, another classical excerpt, the Lars Eric Larsson Concerto, absolutely beautiful saxophone concerto that was uh, premiered on, I believe, Swedish radio. Um, uh, this was around 1937, I think it was premiered. Um, the, the first page of movement one employs a section of these beautiful triplets, very fast moving triplets that start on the low octave and move to the high octave very rapidly back and forth. And people often have trouble with this. Right, so what I'm actually doing, if I slow that down, And that can be quite difficult. And we'll find varying degrees of, of that same kind of um, that same kind of line in, in different pieces, either classical or jazz. And there is a little secret to doing this. And it has to do with voicing and it has to do with using the throat. So the two skills that we were uh, already uh, talking about today, one being uh, using overtone studies to get in touch with throat movement and figuring out which syllable is the right syllable for you. When you have rapid changes, rapid octave movement between registers, favor the lower octave. Always favor the low octave. You'll find that saxophone is an instrument that the high octave comes out very easily. Unless you're pulling your throat down way too far, or if there's something wrong with the instrument, you'll usually find that the high octave comes out without much effort which is part of the reason why people don't often develop their sense of throat movement with respect to high octaves, because it comes out anyway. This is one of the reasons why way back, you know, in 19 blah, 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 <laughs> that uh, uh, Larry Teal, who was uh, uh, one of the first university teachers uh, of saxophone in, in the U.S., had famously said that the saxophone is the easiest instrument to play badly. And I think he was right about that because you look at, let's say, uh, grade schoolers, um, many uh, public schools will have an army of saxophone students because they all love the instrument, yay. But um, despite the fact that they can achieve a tone very easily, shaping that tone and making it sound acceptable for a style is very difficult to do. And part of that is because we have an octave key. We have this wonderful octave key and what a great mechanism that is for us to have such a simple way of moving between octaves. And so we take that for granted that we think the instrument's going to do everything for us, but we do have to help things along. And if you have these octaves, these skills that we already considered today, if you find the optimal position for that low register, don't change your throat when you move to the high octave. Essentially, you're going to make the movement between high and low octave a purely mechanical change. So when I play that, that excerpt for you, I'm just touching my thumb. I'm just thumb, thumb, thumb. That's all I'm doing, but I'm keeping my throat in this position. My throat feels like this. Right? So with respect to how my 
throat is interpreting it, I'm, I may as well be playing in the low octave the entire time. So uh, it's something I discovered over a long period of time, and I suspect that other saxophonists do it in a similar way. Um, and if not, at least it's the way that works for me. But it's still related. It's still related. Um, now, uh, are, are there uh, any specific issues that you'd like to cover? Either if it's something related to this, or you would like me to explain something further that uh, we had already discussed or give a demonstration of something. And if you come up with ideas as, as I'm speaking, please feel free to, uh, to let me know. And, and I'm, I'm happy to shift the conversation in that direction. Um, what I did want to touch on otherwise, if there, if there isn't another suggestion here, is how to apply these ideas to the altissimo range. So um, regardless of style, eventually we all get to a point where we realize, or at least the information is provided to us, that the saxophone can play well outside of its given range. If we're looking at the palm keys as the edge of the saxophone's high register, we can see that we can actually access quite a lot of notes above that. And we can practice this in the same way that the other skills that we talked about today are used. It just happens to be an extreme example. So when we get down to it, Altissimo notes are nothing but high overtones with different fingerings. That's all they are. So if you were to practice overtones and eventually get high enough, you're in the altissimo range on an overtone. Okay. So a good example of this would be if I start again with that low B flat, the first overtone is a B flat. The second overtone above is F with, is the same as F with the octave key. Then above that is B flat with the octave key. Okay. Then above that, the, fi the fifth overtone is uh, the equivalent of the D palm key. The one above that is F with the palm key. And then we're actually in the altissimo range already. So So these overtones that I played, those are in the altissimo range. And the one that I stopped on, that was um, the last one I played was uh, B flat equivalent to. Yeah, equivalent to uh, high B flat. Sorry about that. Um, but this is how I became more comfortable with my altissimo range. Um, part of it is finding a fingering that works for you. And that can be confusing. Um, I think here is one of the few times that your internet, that the internet can be a really good tool, a really useful tool. Um, there's so many fingering combinations that people have found that work and you have to find one that works for you. So uh, one thing that I won't do here because it's just a bit exhaustive is to provide you with a whole, you know, set of fingerings that I use. But um, I can tell you that the sources I have for my fingerings came from many different sources. Um, if you're curious, um, you know, I'm, I'm playing on a modern saxophone, but a lot of the vintage saxophones sometimes require some alternative altissimo fingerings in order to get the note out a little bit easier. But regardless of which fingering you use, it's an overtone and you want to treat it like an overtone. So if you do those 15 minute a day exercises, get in touch with using the throat position, I think you'll find that it's, uh, that it's going to be quite useful for you. Okay, because the objective should be for you to use the altissimo range as another range uh, in the same way that if you wanted to play a scale, why not be able to play a scale up in the altissimo range um, instead of playing one note in the altissimo range and going back down. Um, this often is something that uh, is, is difficult for jazz improvisers that you may find someone who's very adept as an improviser, but they get past a certain range and they're not really that comfortable with um, playing in an articulative way in the altissimo register. I mean, it's I'm using a classical mouthpiece right now and uh, <laughs> trying not to uh, ruffle the feathers of some neighbors. <laughs> but uh, 
uh, that that's also a difficulty is as a saxophonist some things that we practice are a little bit more difficult to do if we're in an environment where we can't just make the noise we want to make um, i'm sure that all of you have felt that already that can sometimes be tough altissimo more than anything else because we tend to play it loud now the objective should be with altissimo to be able to play it at different volumes in the same way that a flutist shouldn't be relying on overblowing in order to play the higher octaves. Because if they do that, the problem is, well, you can get the notes out, but that means you can only play them when you're playing forte. And you want to be able to play them at different volumes. But the skill set for altissimo on saxophone is the same for working on overtones. So um, one other thing to consider that may help you to this end is when I study overtones, when I practice these in the morning, um, I consider that each overtone level above the original note that I'm fingering is virtually the same position for almost any fingering that I try to play that overtone level. So as, as an example, if you play the low B flat and you play the original tone, if I play chromatically up that low uh, register, of course, those are, none of those are overtones. But if I go to the first overtone above B flat and I play subsequently um, in semitones upward, all of those notes should be more or less the same throat position. Okay. So I don't want to paint a picture here that every overtone has such a unique. Um, throat position. It's not the case. You'll have entire swaths of notes that all have more or less the same throat position. And you may find that there are slight variations. Some of it also depends on the individual saxophone that you have. Um, but for example, if I play the first overtone above B flat, and then in the overtone range, progress upward by semitones, all of those notes will have the same throat position. And I should be able to achieve them without having to move my throat. So all of those tones I was able to achieve on the same throat position. So it shows that we have entire registers, entire sets of notes that when we start to practice overtones, which will of course help us in the normal range and in the altissimo range, that we, uh, um, it's, it's not to say that each overtone has a completely different position. That would, be, that would be very, very difficult if that were the case. And you'll find that the higher you go in the overtone range, the same thing applies. If I look at the overtone above that, um, still on the B flat fingering, this is going to be the second overtone above the fundamental. So it will sound like an F. Okay. So all of those are also the same throat position. If I go up a level to the next and then move by half step, all of those are in the same position as well. So we have levels of overtones um, that encompass not just one fingering, but an entire set of notes. So we can kind of consider it that we're moving vertically up the register, but once we get to one level, we can now move horizontally and all the notes in that particular range will have more or less the same throat position. This helps us with altissimo also. The difficulty with altissimo, however, is that there's a misconception that the higher you play, the tighter and tighter and tighter everything has to become. Now, clarinetists also know this, but the secret is when you get past a certain altissimo note, your throat drops back down again. You can actually relax your throat when you get to the extremely high altissimo register. If you hear someone playing really high altissimo notes and you wonder, well, how did they get those notes out? Um, they're not, they shouldn't be biting if they intend to be able to play those notes for any length of time um, and to sustain those tones with a, with a good sound quality. Um, above a certain register, and I'd say above, maybe above uh, altissimo A, you can start to relax the throat. And you may find that when you go very high, 
and you experiment that the optimal throat position is one that's much, much looser than you may have thought. In fact, the edge of the altissimo range, the lower altissimo, if you start from, let's say, F with the front F key to F sharp, G, and G sharp, those notes, I feel, are much tighter and much more unforgiving throat positions than for any of the other altissimo notes. So if you're trying to master your altissimo, first start with those lower altissimo notes because I have to say they're harder to play. So... Right. So the last one I played was uh, G sharp. Those notes have a much tighter throat position than the A, B flat, B, C, even really high up to E and F and F sharp. Those notes tend to have a very loose throat position. So if we think on that and consider how young saxophonists tend to have difficulty even playing low E, low D, part of the reason for that is they often receive poor advice. And the advice they receive is to drop the jaw, make everything go lower. You wanna drop your jaw and your throat to the ground, and then you can get that low note. And that's, that's actually what I was told uh, as, as a child in one of my um, band classes in school. And it's bad advice, unfortunately, because if you loosen the throat enough, you're actually telling the saxophone to play an extremely high altissimo note. So that's part of the reason why if you're progressing downward to those low notes, why sometimes your low D, your low C might flip up the octave without you wanting it to, it may not be because um, you're not loose enough, but you may actually be going in the wrong direction. You may be going too loose. So for example, right? When young saxophonists get that kind of sound, when they try to go downward and they get the octave, consider that some of the benefits of working with overtones and allowing yourself to cascade, not just back down to the lower overtones, but also to the original low note is that you're not just learning about how to play high notes. You're learning about the optimal throat position for your original low position. Um, and I find that my optimal throat position for those lower pitches when I first discovered it was much low, uh, much tighter than I had thought. In a relative sense, it's not very tight at all, but compared to what I had been doing, um, it was a much more firm throat position that allowed me to have a comfortable, reliable low register that I knew would not flip up the octave or crack or anything. So that's really how I found my low position. So I can demonstrate that. So my objective isn't to drop my entire body to the floor when I play those low notes. If we do that, we're more likely for the note to flip up the octave or crack or squeak. And we're also less likely to have a nice robust sound. Keep in mind that the low register of the saxophone, if we're not careful, can boom way too much. And then the high register tends to be thinner. We go to the palm keys on any saxophone voice and it tends to be thin and a little bit raspy. Well, we can take a little bit of that edge off the bottom and actually throw it on the top and then have much more of a robust high register by using overtones. Essentially what you're doing is you're finding an optimal position for the low register and an optimal position for the high register, all the while letting the front of the mouth stay relatively relaxed. You don't have to move your front mouth position for any of this. <laughs> my front mouth position is the same for all of those notes and of course that takes time to become comfortable with it because most saxophone players have some movement in the front as they're playing let's face it everyone does to a certain degree but the question is how much do you really need do you really need to be moving your jaw side to side, up and down? Um, there are many players that move their, their head in a very pronounced way when they're moving between registers. That is also unnecessary. Now, of course, um, you know, if I think of uh, 
of course, this isn't a saxophone example, but uh, at one point, Dizzy Gillespie in his career had sought advice from a classical trumpet player to explore how he could stop puffing his cheeks. And a person that he, that he, he worked with uh, basically told him, I don't really want to do anything to your playing man, because if I do, I'm going to be the guy who ruined Dizzy Gillespie's sound. You sound fantastic. And I think it was an interesting lesson to learn that, yes, he was doing something that traditionally was considered wrong, but he had a beautiful sound. He sounded great. So for all the advice that I'm giving, you may be very happy with your sound, and I'm not trying to rock that boat, but just consider that there may be more efficient ways to do something, and that in your practicing, whatever methods you use, that attaining the muscle memory to recreate that is important. So for me, the practice room is a less expressive time musically, and it's more of an analytical laboratory kind of approach. Um, I try things, I listen to the result, and I try not to be discouraged if the result isn't what I want. I actually use that as information to try the next time. So if you hear a squeak or you hear an overtone that's too high, well, I can say, oh, well, maybe my throat position was higher than it needed to be. So use your mistakes as a path to success. And I think you'll find that practicing can become a much more meditative process. And um, I hadn't mentioned it before, but if you have the ability to record yourself as you practice, that's an incredibly useful tool, especially if you can record yourself with reliable quality. Um, and then give yourself maybe uh, at least a couple of days to forget exactly what you sounded like that day and then listen to it as if you're listening to someone else and hear yourself and critique yourself. Um, I think it could be very enlightening. It could be very fun to do that too. Sorry about that. Um, so I wonder, uh, we, we have a, only maybe three minutes or so left. Um, do you have any questions or um, um, I, I do want to leave some time if you had any questions about what I was uh, asking you or if there's anything that came to mind uh, during the conversation. Um, I am very thankful that, uh, that you chose to uh, come to this webinar. Um, and, uh, you know, now more than ever, I think it's very important for all of us to know that we are all the same community and we are all in this together. And whatever your musical goals are, whether they're for yourself, for your own enjoyment, or whether this is your career or anything in between, uh, we're all part of the same community. Um, and it's a very fun community to be a part of. So um, I'm happy that, uh, that I had been asked to be a part of this. So I, I hope that it was useful to you. I hope that it was helpful. And um, if at any point any of you have any questions for me, I believe that my contact information, my email may be um, may have uh, been provided, and I'd be happy to uh, I'd be happy to chat with you at any point. Okay, so it's nice to make some new friends and some from around the world. So thank you so much, and thank you too. I appreciate your participation. I'm, I'm happy that it was useful, and uh, yeah. So. Stay in touch, okay? I'm, I'm very happy to do so. I'm also on Facebook. Uh, you can just search Scott Litroff. So you're very, you know, I'm very happy to uh, Facebook friend you and I am on Instagram um, and we can keep in touch. And I'd, I'd certainly like to hear from all of you um, anything that you're doing. If you post your videos, then please uh, send a link. I'd love to hear it. Thank you guys. All right. So um, I hope that you and your families uh, stay safe and well. And uh, yeah. Let's stay in this together and we'll all, you know, we'll all move along together. So thanks so much, guys. Have a wonderful day. I believe it was, I believe that we have an hour. So I don't know if it closes automatically at 12 or if maybe I'm just meant to uh, close it off at 12. But uh, I believe that's, I believe that's it. Okay. Take care, Lane. Thank you. All right, everyone. Bye now.